Def Leppard originated in a Sheffield-based group that teenagers Rick Savage and Pete Willis formed in 1977. Vocalist Joe Elliott a fanatical follower of Mott the Hoople and T-Rex, joined the band several months later, bringing the name Def Leppard with him. After a spelling change, the trio augmented by a now-forgotten drummer, began playing local Sheffield pubs, and within a year the band had added guitarist Steve Clark to the lineup, as well as a new drummer. Later in 1978, they recorded their debut EP Get Your Rocks Off, and released it on their own label Bludgeon Riffola. The EP became a word-of-mouth success, earning airplay on the BBC. Following the release of Get Your Rocks Off, 15-year-old Rick Allen was added as the band's permanent drummer, and Def Leppard quickly became the toast of the British Music Weeklies. They soon signed with ACDC's manager Peter Mensch, who helped them secure a contract with Mercury Records. On Through the Night, the band's full-length debut was released in 1980 and instantly became a hit in the UK, also earning significant airplay in the US, where it reached number 51 on the charts. Over the course of the year, Def Leppard relentlessly toured Britain and America, playing their own shows while also opening concerts for Ozzy Osbourne, Sammy Hagar, and Judas Priest. High End Dry followed in 1981 and became the group's first platinum album in the US, thanks to MTV's strong rotation of Bringin' on the Heartbreak. As the band recorded the follow-up to High and Dry with producer Mutt Lang, Pete Willis was fired from the group because of his alcoholism, and Phil Collin a former guitarist for Girl, was hired to replace him. The resulting album in 1983's Pyromania became an unexpected blockbuster, due not only to Def Leppard's skillful melodic metal, but also to MTV's repeated airing of Photograph and Rock of Ages. Pyromania went on to sell 10 million copies, establishing Def Leppard as one of the most popular bands in the world. Despite their success, they were about to enter a trying time in their career. Following an extensive international tour, the group re-entered the studio to record the follow-up, but producer Lang was unavailable, so they began sessions with Jim Steinman, the man responsible for Meatloaf's Bat Out of Hell. The pairing turned out to be ill-advised, so the band members turned to their former engineer Nigel Green. One month into recording, Alan lost his left arm in a New Year's Eve car accident. The arm was reattached, but it had to be amputated once an infection set in. Def Leppard's future looked cloudy without a drummer, but by the spring of 1985 just a few months after his accident, Alan began learning to play a custom-made electronic kit assembled for him by Simmons. The band soon resumed recording, and within a few months, Lang was back on board having judged all the existing tapes inferior, he ordered the band to begin work all over again. Recording sessions continued throughout 1986, and that summer the group returned to the stage for the European Monsters of Rock tour. Def Leppard finally completed their fourth album, now titled Hysteria early in 1987. The record was released that spring to lukewarm reviews, with many critics claiming that the album compromised Leppard's metal roots for sweet pop flourishes. Accordingly, Hysteria was slow out of the starting gates women, the first single, failed to really take hold but the release of Animal helped the album gather steam. The song became Def Leppard's first top 40 hit in the UK, but more importantly, it launched a string of six straight top 20 hits in the US, which also included Hysteria, Pour Some Sugar On Me, Love Bites, Armageddon It and Rocket, the latter of which arrived in 1989, a full two years after the release of Hysteria. During those two years, Def Leppard's presence was unavoidable they were the kings of high school metal, ruling the pop charts and MTV, and teenagers and bands alike replicated their teased hair and ripped jeans, even when the grimy hard rock of Guns N' Roses took hold in 1988. Hysteria proved to be the peak of Leppard's popularity, yet their follow-up remained eagerly awaited in the early 90s, as the band took a break from the road and set to work on a new record. During the recording process, however Steve Clark died from an overdose of alcohol and drugs. Clark had historically battled alcohol, and following their hysteria heyday, his bandmates forced him to take a sabbatical. Although he did enter rehab, 
Clark's habits continued, and his abuse was so crippling that Colin began recording the majority of the band's guitar leads. Following Clark's death, Def Leppard resolved to finish their forthcoming album as a quartet, releasing Adrenalize in the spring of 1992. Adrenalize was greeted with mixed reviews, and even though the album debuted at number one and contained several successful singles, including the top 20 hits Let's Get Rocked and Have You Ever Needed Someone So Bad, the record was a commercial disappointment in the wake of Pyromania and Hysteria. After its release, the group added former Whitesnake guitarist Vivian Campbell to the lineup, thus resuming Def Leppard's two guitar attack. In 1993, Def Leppard issued the Rarities Collection Retroactive, which yielded another top 20 hit with the acoustic ballad Two Steps Behind. Two years later, the group released the Greatest Hits Collection Vault while preparing for their sixth album. Slang arrived in the spring of 1996, and while it proved more adventurous than its predecessor, it was greeted with indifference, indicating that Leppard's heyday had indeed passed, and they were now simply a very popular cult band. Undaunted Leopard soldiered on, returning to their patented pop metal sound for Euphoria, which was released in June of 1999. Despite the success of Promises, the record failed to produce any additional hits, resulting in a return to adult pop balladry on 2002's X. The two-disc Rock of Ages The Definitive Collection arrived in 2005, followed in 2006 by Yeah, a strong collection of covers. In 2008, the guys released their 10th studio album, Songs from the Sparkle Lounge, which debuted at number 5 and was supported by a lucrative summer tour. Material from that tour helped make up the bulk of 2011's Mirrorball Live and More, a three-disc live album containing a full concert, three new studio recordings, and DVD footage. Another live album followed two years later, Viva Hysteria found Def Leppard running through their 1987 blockbuster in its entirety on the first disc, and a collection of early, rarely played material on the second. In 2015 the band released Def Leppard their 11th studio album and first collection of original music since 2008. In February 2017, the group issued and there will be a next time, a live album culled from the Def Leppard supporting tour. Later that year, a super deluxe edition of Hysteria came out in celebration of the record's 30th anniversary. Further repackagings continued in 2018 with a box set of their 80s albums titled The Collection Volume 1 and The Story So Far, The Best of Def Leppard, a multi-disc set that included the band's first four studio albums and various rarities. The next year saw the release of The Collection, Volume 2 a set of their 90s records, and The Story So Far Volume 2 hits and b-sides, which picked up where the first volume left off with material from the band's 90s run and beyond. Def Leppard continued to tour on a regular basis and played a Las Vegas residency, then in 2020 issued a collection of their first two albums plus a live set and BBC sessions titled The Early Years 79-81. to After this slew of live and reissued material, the band finally released another studio album in 2022 their 12th. Entitled Diamond Star Halos, it was heralded by the barnstorming, old-school promo track Kick and featured two collaborations with Alison Krauss. After knowing the journey of Def Leppard, here are the facts about Def Leppard. When the story of Def Leppard drummer Rick Allen losing his arm in an auto accident comes up, it's easy to focus on the inspiring aspects of it. As Louder explains, Allen initially thought his career was over, but he began tapping a foam insert on his hospital bed with his feet while listening to music. His friend Pete Harley built a custom electric drum kit for him, and Allen dedicated himself to learning a whole new way of drumming, leading to his triumphant return to live performances in 1986. After three gigs with a backup drummer just in case, Allen took over on his own. That's an amazing story, but as Monterey County Weekly notes, it hides the darker side of Allen's recovery. Allen has admitted that by focusing exclusively on the band and getting back behind the drum kit, he didn't deal with his trauma at all. He began to self-medicate with alcohol, going to a very dark place. I literally threw myself right back into the band, didn't do any work on myself or therapy, he told Monterey County Weekly. It all culminated in a 1997 domestic abuse charge. Allen pled guilty and was sentenced to community service and Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. It wasn't until Allen met his future wife, a massage therapist, 16 years after his accident, that he began to confront his pain and heal.
Def Leppard struggled with addiction. Problems with drugs and alcohol are so common in the stories of successful rock bands that they're pretty cliché, but that doesn't take away from the personal tragedy these afflictions can cause. And Def Leppard has had to deal with the cost of substance abuse more than most bands. Ultimate Classic Rock reports that the band had to fire one of its founding members because of his drinking. Guitarist Pete Willis had been with Def Leppard from the very beginning, and was working with them on the future classic Pyromania when his drinking got so bad he could barely function. When he was incapable of playing on a track in the studio because he was drunk, the band fired him. Willis has no bitterness in fact, he told Classic Rock it wasn't nice to go that way, but it was something that needed to happen for them, and the best thing to happen health-wise for me. Willis replacement, Phil Collin loved to drink as well, and he found a buddy in fellow guitarist Steve Clark. According to Loudwire, the two quickly became great friends and serious drinking buddies. They earned the shared nickname the Terror Twins because of their wild, booze-fueled ways. Clark's drinking was so bad he would wake up in the morning shaking uncontrollably and had to have a drink to make it stop. After losing his arm in a car accident, drummer Rick Allen struggled with alcohol too, eventually entering Alcoholics Anonymous after a court order. Def Leppard almost broke up. According to Louder, after Def Leppard drummer Rick Allen miraculously recovered from losing his arm in an auto accident and continued to play, the band thought they'd seen and faced it all, and that nothing would ever be so bad. But when guitarist Steve Clark died of an accidental overdose in 1991, it nearly shattered them. Loudwire reports that Phil Collin, who had been Clark's best friend and drinking buddy in the band, went into mourning for his friend and quit the band, convinced that it would be impossible to keep playing after what had happened. The loss of both guitarists might have broken the band for good despite the incredible success they'd enjoyed. Lead singer Joe Elliott spoke with Colin and convinced him to stay. He told Colin that Clark had been ashamed of his addiction, and would have never wanted the band to suffer because of his affliction. The talk brought Colin back from the brink. He decided to stay with the band and used songwriting and performing as therapy. In 1992, the band hired Vivian Campbell to replace Clark, and Def Leppard have released six more albums since then.